Well, let's go to the book of Luke, chapter 9, probably a familiar verse that I probably have preached here. I know I've at least mentioned these in preaching before. Luke, chapter 9, verse 57 through 62. Here, Christ and his disciples, at the very least, James and John were with him. And it says, And then it came to pass, verse 57, that as they, speaking of Christ and the disciples, went in the way, a certain man said unto him, Lord, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. And Jesus said unto him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. And he said unto another, Follow me. But he said, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. And Jesus said unto him, Let the dead bury their dead, but go thou and preach the kingdom of God. And others said also, Lord, I will follow thee, but let me first go bid them farewell, which are at home at my house. And Jesus said unto him, No man having put his hand to the plow, looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. Yeah. So I'd like. I guess if I had a title for this message, it would be a Casual Christianity or Part-Time Followers. Let's go to the Lord in prayer before we begin. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time we have together with our people tonight, Lord, and I just pray that you use it. Lord, use the message that we preach, Lord. I pray that you give us leadership of the Holy Spirit as we preach, Lord. I do pray that you bless Brother Larry, Lord, to give him strength and you heal him up, Lord, that you be back again this Lord's day. If you'd be able to preach again, Lord, that you would use them here, I pray, for many years in your service, Lord. I do pray for his kidney and that you might heal that up as well. I pray that you would be with each request that was mentioned, Lord. I pray for Brother Mark Titus that you might heal him even to this cancer, Lord. You give him grace, Lord. No doubt it's a difficult situation for him to be in, Lord. I pray that you would. Help us here in the church be, to be busy about the work you call us to do. I just thank you for that great faithfulness towards us. Help us to be faithful to thee, Lord. I thank you for all you do for us. I do pray that you might save souls. Even tonight, you might save a soul among us, Lord. I thank you for saving my soul. I thank you for Christ and his sacrifice. In the name of Christ, I pray. Amen. Yeah. Well, here we have three people who. So the average person didn't seem too bad, did they? And the first person he says, Lord, I'll follow thee whithersoever thou goest. That seems like a noble thing to say. Yeah. What do we really mean? We'll follow whithersoever we go. This person had the idea that he was gonna gain something, I think. Mm. That it was gonna lead to some prosperity possibly or something that he would gain from. But well, to follow Christ would have been to follow him to the cross, wouldn't it? If you remember what happened when Christ was arrested, all the disciples left him. John was the only one that stood close enough to him to hear him at the cross and be spoken to. Well, to follow Christ is not necessarily an easy road, is it? To follow Christ isn't always going to be the prosperous and healthy way of many priests today. No, he says, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but son of man hath not where to lay his head. We can't follow Christ with the expectation that we're going to gain something physically, materially. And we'll gain a whole lot spiritually to follow him. Christ in his own humanity was homeless, if you will. He said he didn't have a place to work, lay his head. And yet many today think they should be prosperous because they follow God. Now John did say that, that he desired for the church to be prosperous and in health, as your soul also prospers. And certainly we shouldn't desire to see our brothers and sisters destitute and the poor and needy. Yet our desire ought not to be first and foremost for the things of this world. And this 
second person here, Christ told him, follow me. When he said, Lord, suffer me first, you go and bury my father. It's another quest didn't seem so bad, I did it. Not to the flesh at least. The problem was he had other things to do besides following Christ. So we oftentimes have other things to do, or so we say. You know, I've got this to do, I've got to do that, or I've got to go, you know, I've got to go work, I've got to go mow the grass, I've got to do all these other things. I'm too busy to serve God, is what we're essentially saying. And I know there's there things that have to be done in this world. But first and foremost, how we come following Christ. And Christ said, let the dead bury their dead, and go down for the kingdom of God. Let this world take care of the things of this world. Our first thing we ought to do is serve God and then let the other things fall into place. What do you say? Seek first the kingdom of God, his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Speaking of your physical needs, that's in Matthew chapter 6. So God knows what we have need of. Certainly, he's able to provide for them. We we act as if we have to take care of all these other things first, and then we have some time left over and we'll serve God. That's the average Christian today. After you, you get up and you go to work or whatever it is you do throughout the day, and you maybe if you have an hour or two left over, you'll think about it, but usually not. So this last person here, he he bid to follow me. You. And another also said, Lord, I will follow thee, but let me first go bid them farewell, which are at home at my house. So this guy had his priorities wrong, didn't he? He said, I'll follow you, but first I go to this other thing. Mm -hmm. Well, we can't say we're going to follow Christ, but first we're going to do something else. Mm -hmm. right. Christ said to him, No man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. We can't sit out to serve God and look back to this world. Christ said, no man that does that is fit for the kingdom of God. But too often times, oh, those who profess the name of Christ, they start out seemingly serving him, and then before long, they're back to the ways of the world. Yeah. Yeah. No, we are to put our hand to the plow and not look back ever again. The problem is we want to have our one hand on the plow and one hand on the plow of this world, don't we? That's what most people want at least. They want to be having both ways and you can't do that. Yeah. Uh, well, I, had, I think I, I posted this on Facebook, but I had a thought earlier today when I was studying, I think even maybe earlier this week. But I said, it was as a young believer, I used to think everyone who professed to be saved wanted to sincerely serve God. I said, boy, was I wrong. There's a countless number of people who profess to be Christian and yet seem to have no desire to serve God whatsoever. Mm -hmm. That's really not even possible by the definition of Christian, though. To be Christ-like means we are to do the bidding of God, isn't it? Christ submitted himself wholly to God, even praying in his agony, not my will, but thine will be done. Yet oftentimes we, maybe we don't say that, but we think that, Lord, I know this is what you want, but can we really do it this way? Yeah. But what does it mean to follow Christ? Here we have three that some will call half-hearted followers, and some would call, some don't, excuse me, I would think they didn't really follow him at all because they made excuses. But what does it really mean to follow Christ? I mean, in a literal sense, it's, it means let him do the leading, doesn't it? Not us try to tell him what to do, but let him tell us what to do. I'm afraid many today are like the lay out of sin. They think they're really doing something for God, and they're not really doing much of anything. 
I'm going to turn there for just a second. Revelation 3, I can't quite remember exactly how the words go. Revelation chapter 3, verse 15 through 17. Christ words to them. He says, I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would if thou art cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, miserable, and poor, and naked, or, and blind, and naked. And here they thought they were okay, and they said, I am rich, and I am increased with goods, I have need of nothing. In reality, they were wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Yeah. I'm afraid many, many professing Christians today are exactly that, though. You know, I'm all right. I'm doing this, this work for the cause of Christ, and I don't really need to do anything else, do I? I'm not going to try to pick on Brother Junior, but he's easy target for me. Right? <laughs> So the junior might say, well, I'm a Sunday school teacher. I lead the singing. I do, I'm the clerk. I'm doing quite a bit for God, ain't I? So we know, really, is there any amount of work we can do that can ever repay? And what say if half of Christians did as much as Brother Junior does for the church, well, most God's churches would be doing quite a bit, wouldn't they? Yeah. Most want to just come on Sunday and listen to a few songs and hear some teaching and preaching and go home. Maybe if they decide to, they'll come on Wednesday night. You know, there's no such thing as a part-time Christian, though. Back in Luke chapter 9, a few verses prior, verse 23. Here, Christ speaking again to his disciples. He says in verse 23, and he said unto them all, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Notice his command is to take up his cross daily and follow him. To follow Christ, though, isn't going to be easy work, is it? Taking up a cross isn't the easiest thing to do. If you remember Christ in his agony, he was fell down multiple times and had a I'd have Simon the Cyrenian to help him. So certainly taking up a cross and carrying it every day is not going to be all a bed of roses, as they say. But yet it's our command today we take up the cross and follow Christ, whatever that our cross may be. But then just say on Sunday and maybe Wednesday or you know, Sunday, Wednesday, and one Friday a month. So every day we're to follow Christ. Yeah. And that seems to be the opposite of the way many Christians live today. They, they say they serve Him on Sunday and worship Him on Sunday, and yet they live like the world the rest of the week. They yeah. Don't even give them a thought throughout the week. I mean, I... Could admit I've probably been there myself at some point in my life that you go to church, you don't think about the next service again. What a shame for a child of God to be in such a place, though. But we are to take up our cross and follow Christ every day. Let's go over to Matthew chapter 10 for a moment. I believe Brother Larry read Luke's account of this. On Sunday, Matthew 10, verse 37 to 38 says, He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me, and he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. To follow Christ means we must love him supremely. We can't love others of this world more than Christ. It's not the great commandment to love God first and foremost. With all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy might. This is the first and great commandment Christ said in Matthew 22. And he goes on to say, The second like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two hang all the law and prophets. 
Now this teaching here in Matthew 10 seems a little bit opposite of what we think about in American society today. We're to love family first and foremost, aren't we? And certainly we ought to love our family. Husbands ought to love our wives as Christ loved the church. Wives ought to love their husbands and their children, and children ought to love their parents. But we are not serving God correctly if we love them more than we love God. If we love them more than we love Christ, then they've become an idol unto us. Really, if we love anything more than we love God, it's become an idol unto us, whether it's our family, or cars, or houses, or jobs, or money. He, he, he says that if we love any of these more than him, we're not worthy of him. If we don't take our cross and follow him, we're not worthy of him. And how often we fail in doing that, don't we? <laughs> the whole point of what he's teaching in that particular passage is that we are to give ourselves wholly to him, our lives and everything to him in the service of Christ. So most of they want they want to live their life and then let God have the leftovers, won't they? We can't do that and be a wholehearted follower of Christ. So John chapter 14 tells us how to love Christ, how he tells us how to love him. John chapter 14, verse 15. We've probably all heard this particular verse before. He says, if you love me, keep my commandments. In verse 21, he says, He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he that is that loveth me, and he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. Verse 23, he says, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. He that loveth me not, he would not my sayings, and the word which he hear is not mine, but the Father which sent me. It seems pretty plain that if we love God, we're to keep his commandments. If we, if we love Christ, we're to keep his commandments. Because if we don't love him, we won't keep his commandments. I know none of us are going to be perfect, but I have a big problem with those who say they love God yet live completely in wickedness and sinfulness. We can't use grace as an excuse either, can we? So 1 John 5 also tells us the same thing that Christ tells us here, to, to love God, to keep his commandments. So we wasn't just talking to the disciples here. So Romans 6, verse 14 says that we are no longer under the law, but under grace. He says, what then shall we... Say, shall we continue in sin because we are under the under grace? God forbid. No, we cannot continue in sin because we are under grace. Or thinks it, shall we sin because we are under grace? No, grace is not an excuse to sin. If anything, grace ought to drive us away from sin. Grace ought to drive us to serve God. In Titus chapter two, verses eleven and twelve, tell us that the grace of God appeared unto all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust. We are live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. And the grace of God will teach one that they ought to live right in this world. That's why you really don't have to tell someone who's been truly born again that they ought to live godly. Now you might have to instruct them on what godly living is and what the Bible teaches about it. But if someone's truly experienced the grace of God, that grace of God in them will tell them to live godly, righteously in this present world. Like I said, that's why I have a problem with those who profess to be Christian and yet live just like the world, live still in ungodliness and wickedness. The one 
heard some try to say, well, you'll never, you're trusting in works for salvation. No, salvation produces works, not the other way around. It's really the whole reason we were created a new creature in Christ, wasn't it? I think we all know Ephesians 2, verse 8 and 9. For by grace are you saved through faith, and not of yourselves, but it is the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. The verse 10 goes on to say, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. And we're to walk in good works that we've been born again. And we are to serve him if we've been born again. That's really the whole reason he saved us, that we might serve him. But certainly, we escape hell by salvation. Certainly, we escape the wrath that is to come. And we benefit very much from salvation only, but the only thing really God asks in return, if he will, is that we serve him. Let's go to Colossians for a moment. Colossians chapter 3. Verses 1 and 2 say, If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is on the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above, not on things on the earth. If we're seeking, or if we're following Christ, we're not going to follow this world, are we? We're in direct opposition one to another. We're all happy to fulfill it, fill yourself up with the things of this world, and all it has to offer. But here we're told to seek those things which are above where Christ is on the right hand of God. We're to seek the things of Christ. Set your affections on things above, not on things on the earth. Yeah. Our affection ought to be first and foremost to Christ and, and God and to the service of God. Mm -hmm. The problem is we don't love God as we ought to. That's really the root cause, if you will. Because if we love God, we would keep His commandments. If we love God, we would serve Him. If we loved Him and feared Him as we ought to, we would not be too concerned with the things of this world. Yeah. In fact, 1 John 2 tells us, to love not the world, neither the things of this, neither the things of the world, all that is in the world, the lust of the eye, the pride of life, the lust of flesh, are not of the Father. You say the world passed away and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Well, Christ is not going to necessarily lead us to a wealthy, prosperous life. Now, I'm not saying that's an impossibility for the child of God, but the majority of the time, that's not the way for the Christian to go, is it? On the other hand, he's also they would also say that I've not seen his seed begging bread. Well, Christ doesn't usually lead to the poorhouse either. He'll give you what you need if you trust in him. When he said he would provide all our riches according for all our needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus, but he didn't say he would provide all our wants, did he? That's where we oftentimes get a little mixed up. At least as Americans. I just, when I talk to a brother in the Philippines pretty often, when they live in this little one room hut, basically, the house, and we get dissatisfied with our, really, their mansions compared to what they live in. So they have one little rinky car that gets them around, breaks down on them from time to time. You know, we're not happy if we don't drive the nicest thing available. This particular brother lives in a pretty poor part of the Philippines, I mean, poorer than the average. So he, load, he loads up his little motorcycle and drives around and picks up the church members on Sunday morning, starting about 6 o'clock, bringing them to the church house. And we're 
oftentimes too, I'm always lazy, I guess, to get up and get ready to come to the services in our comfy car or air conditioned building. You know, America, American Christianity is very casual, isn't it? It's not like that in all parts of the world, but it certainly is here. You know, be a Christian as you feel like it. You no, know, I don't know how we've gotten to this place, other than we live in a very materialistic society. I guess we've let too much of the world get into the church and into our own lives. But yet, we would really love God as we ought to. We would realize the things of this world are fleeting, aren't they? Let's go over to John chapter 15 for a moment. And we mentioned fruits earlier and works. Good works, good fruits there, are synonymous. John chapter 15, verse number 8. It says, Herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. For following Christ means we ought to bear much fruit. You know, there's not necessarily a quantity on much fruit. It doesn't mean you've got to produce five a day, or ten a day, or a hundred a day. Everyone is given them to their own measure of grace. In fact, we can turn over to Mark in here in a minute, but some might produce more than others, but he just says we are to bring forth much fruit to be his disciple. And in doing so, God the Father is glorified. Should that not be one of our chief aims is to glorify God as a Christian? It shouldn't be to bring glory to ourselves and look at me and look what I have done. Rather, it should be to look at God and what He can do for you. Look what He has done for me. The Bible oftentimes tells us that it should be common knowledge, it seems like, but yet we miss it all the time. 2 Corinthians 9 6, we want to turn there, but Paul writes that if we sow sparingly, we shall reap sparingly. If we sow bountifully, we shall also reap bountifully. That seems like common sense, doesn't it? If I go out and put one tomato plant in the ground, assuming God calls it to grow, and I take care of it, then I'll get one tomato plant, right? If I go out and put 20 in the ground, I should get 20 back, right? Yet we act as if we're surprised when we put little effort in the service of God and we get nothing back. No, we don't. We're praying, praying, preparing for little services of each Wednesday and Sunday is a good example. We don't put any effort into it, we probably won't get much out of it. Many professing Christians today treat God like he's a genie in the lamp, though, don't they? Just take him out and you know, get three wishes when they want to put them back away for a while. That's not how the service of God works, is it? We're serving Him all the time. We can't expect, put in part time work and expect full time benefits. Put it sacredly and spiritually, that's how we, many of you live today, isn't it? <coughs> nope. Galatians 6, verse 7 and 8 says, God is not mocked, for whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. If we sow to corruption, we shall reap to corruption. If we sow the Spirit, we shall reap life everlasting. No, I can't go out and plant a tomato plant and expect corn stock to grow either, can you? But again, we act surprised when we sow a whole bunch of things in the world and we don't get spiritual things back. <clears throat> you know, I remember when I was child and my stepdad used to grow a big old garden, probably close to an acre at the biggest I've seen it. And we have so much that you, we can it, freeze it, I'd sell it, we give it away, we still have leftover. That's sowing bountifully and reaping bountifully. But no, most of the day they want to put out one little, if we put out one tomato plant, one corn plant, one 
squash plant, one cucumber vine, you, you wouldn't have gotten much back, would you? Yeah. You most want to put in just the minimal amount of effort and expect the greatest benefits or the greatest reward. You know, God will bless us according to what we put in for him. He said, if we pray to the Father in secret, he will reward us openly. If we fast in secret, he will reward us openly. If we give all in secret, he will reward us openly. So most people aren't doing those things at all. And they still say, well, God, I'm looking for my reward. That's not how God works, is it? Let's go over to Mark chapter 4 for just a moment. Mark chapter 4 and verse number 18. Uh, he's expounding on the parable of the silver. And he says, And these are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word, and the cares of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches, and the lust of other things entering in, choke the word and become unfruitful. See, worldliness causes us to become unfruitful in the service of God. It literally chokes us out spiritually. In verse 20 he says, And these are, some, these are they which are sown on good ground, such as hear the word and receive it and bring forth some thirtyfold, some sixty, and some hundred. That's one we ought to desire to be. He wants someone on the good ground to bring forth much fruit. As he says here, some, some 30, some 60, and some 100 fold. You now, most today are those that are sown in the th thorns, aren't they? But they're there, but they're not bearing any fruit. So, yeah, they're filled with pews on Sunday, but they're not really doing anything for the service of God. But really, we can't say just because we're here on Sunday and we're here on Sunday and Wednesday that we're doing God a favor. We can't act as if just because we're, or even the preacher, the teacher, whoever position we may have, that we're in favor of God just because of that. Or that we're really doing something for God because, yeah, I, I preach every Sunday. Or I teach every Sunday, or I teach, you know, I teach the children, and I sing, lead singing, and I teach the afternoon class, and I'm you know, not pointing fingers at anybody. Or just because we have these positions, or do these things for God, we can't as, act as if we're really serving God just because we have those positions in the church. Yet there's many, many today that act like that, aren't there? No, what we ought to, <coughs> the service for God really is how we live outside of the church building, isn't it? Certainly how we conduct ourselves here, what we do here, how we prepare for the service here, are part of it. How we live out in the world is another part of it, isn't it? Do we tell others about Christ? Do we live a godly example before those that are around us? Do we, do others even know that we're a Christian? They ought to be able to tell it by the way we act and conduct ourselves. They ought to be able to tell it by the way we talk and the things we talk about. And really they ought to be able to tell it because we've told them about Christ himself. Yet there, I can tell you, can't tell you how many times I've heard conversations, oh, you're a Christian, or oh, you go to this church? I didn't even know. That's a poor testimony for the child of God, isn't it? You know, the, the prodigal son, he desired worldliness, didn't he? We won't have to turn over there, but Luke chapter 15 tells us the story of the prodigal son. He went and he blew it all, all that he had on righteous living, it says. He partied up, he had a good old time. He ended up destitute, didn't he? Mm -hmm. He ended up just wishing he could eat pig's food. And that's exactly where worldliness and sin will lead, especially for a child of God. 
up your heads, he'll chastise you. And it probably won't be very enjoyable to the flesh. You know, Lot is a, another example, I think, of one who tried to be worldly and yet be a servant of God at the same time. He was called a righteous man. But he says, in seeing and hearing, he vexed his righteous soul. How did that end up for Lot anyway? I mean, he ended up out of Sodom, he lost all those possessions, he lost his wife, and he didn't have a testimony either. And that's exactly where trying to live worldly will lead the child of God. Yeah. Well, and <clears throat> some people when you use Solomon as an example, he was a wealthy man, wasn't he? But Solomon was a wise man too. He tried all the things of this world. What did he say there in Ecclesiastes? Over and over again, vanity, 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 and vexation of spirit. Let's turn there to chapter 12, real quick, of Ecclesiastes. And Solomon was a quite a rich and powerful man, probably one of the most rich and powerful men of his day. And yet, after trying all the things of this world, <laughs> chapter 12, verse 8, as we get to the end of the book here, he says, Vanity of vanity, say it's preacher, all is vanity. All the things of this world were emptiness to him, they were worthless to him. You know, it's verse 13, he says, Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God, keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work and judgment with every secret thing. Whether it be good or whether it be evil. Well, we all heed the words of Solomon, shouldn't we? Yeah. To fear God, keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Well, that's the duty of man, whether you're saved or not. But it's especially our duty if we've been born again. We are to serve God and fear him. All the things of this world will not. Satisfy like Christ can. Men seek after all the things of this world all the time. All, every day they're getting more money, getting more cars, getting more possessions, more material goods, bigger houses, whatever it may be. And yet they're still wanting more each and every day, aren't they? The covetous man is never satisfied. So that we appear, God keep his commandments. That is what the wisest man in the world came to the conclusion of. After he tried so much of this world and all that it had to offer. And notice what he says in verse 14. For God shall bring every work in judgment, every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. You can be sure we'll give an account before God one day. And Romans 14, 12 tells us that. That even yes, the child of God will give account of ourselves before God. I'm not going to give an account for Brother Adam. He's not going to give an account for me. I'm going to give an account for myself. Yeah. Second Corinthians 5, 10 also tells us that we will answer for the deeds done in this body, whether it be good or evil. You can also be sure that if you're not saved here, you'll give an account before God too. It'll be a little different. So many people, they want to be judged by their works. They think their good works will outweigh their bad works. But Revelation 20 tells us one day they will be judged by their works. The problem is they're going to be all found on team, aren't they? And then when the land's book of life is open, no one will be found in there, will they? None that trusted in their works, none that trusted in their baptism and church membership, none that trusted anything besides Christ and Christ alone. And they shall be cast alive into the lake of fire, spend all eternity except from the part from God. Now let's turn it over real quick to 2 Peter and we'll close. 2 Peter chapter 3. Thinking on this thought of judgment. 
Peter talks about what shall be at the end of the world, and he says, in verse number 10, But the day of the Lord will come with a thief in the night, in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with the curtain heat, the earth also, and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of person ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? Looking forward, hastening unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and elements shall melt with burning heat. But one day all this around is going to melt away. He says here, heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with the burning heat. The earth also shall, and the earth also, and the works that are therein shall be burned up. All this that man strives for and seeks after and lumps up to himself, and it's all going to be burned up one day. He says, seeing then, all these things shall be dissolved. He says, what manner of person ought you be in all holy conversation and godliness? Seeing all these things are going to be passed away one day, shouldn't that drive us to be holy and godly in our, our conversation here or in our conduct? Well, this world is not going to last very long, is it? And judging by the things that are going on in this world, I'm not sure that's going to be even very much longer at all. Yeah. Well, one day, it'll all melt away. It'll all be burnt up with the fervent heat, he says. Yeah. Verse 12 says, The heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with the fervent heat. And what will it matter? What kind of car we drove, or what kind of house we had, or how much money we had in bank accounts? It would be very little, won't it? I know we need all those things to survive in this world. You know, I was just out of curiosity looking. It would, if we all got rid of our cars and walked everywhere, you know, that's, I almost say that's the right thing to do. I think it would take for that one about three and a half hours to walk to work one way. But it'll literally take about nine hours or more. That's assuming you don't stop anywhere along the way. So no, we couldn't survive very well in this world without a vehicle. It's not that things of this world necessarily like that are evil in and of themselves, but they can become evil when we put too much emphasis on them. Yeah. And we know Brother Adam talks about his truck sometimes, and I don't, he has problems with it every now and then. You know, I think he'll tell you he usually gets them from where he needs to go from point A to point B. But he doesn't necessarily need to roll his voice or bend me, does he? Not sure that Tim pays enough for that anyway, but. <laughs> we oftentimes think we need a lot more than we really need, don't we? Yeah. The prophets often had very little, didn't they? Christ had very little in this world. The disciples themselves weren't exactly rich folks either. Said, I'm not saying God can't save the rich, or He said He can. He can do all things, can't He? He can save the simplest, the poorest, or the richest and the most famous person. Yep. Our emphasis, our affection ought not to be on things of this world. They ought to be on serving God. Let us not be like those three we read about in the beginning. They made excuses, had other things to do, had their priorities wrong, or were looking to gain something out of it. Let us simply serve God because He has saved us by His marvelous grace. Let us serve Him because we love Him. Over in 1 John, it says, How then? I'm paraphrasing a little bit, I think, here, but he says, If they don't love the brethren whom they have seen, how shall they love God whom they have not seen? We ought to love our brothers and sisters in Christ. That's our first manifestation that we love God. And keeping his commandments, that's how we show that we love him. But one of his commands was to love one another. That's what's supposed to separate the Christian from the Muslim, the Buddhist, the all these other religions of the world that we would love one another, that we care for one for another. Because there's not very much love in God's churches anymore. And I'm not preaching the you know, God is only love and all this. Love requires rebuke sometimes. Love requires correction. 
And the law doesn't overlook sin and wink at it. And there's not much love for each other, not much love to, for lost souls either, though. Well, we're in a pitiful shape, I think, as God's people today, where we just do things as we want to, we pick and choose what we want to follow, and you know, you say, well, I don't know why God's not blessing, I don't know why we don't see revival, I don't know why souls aren't being saved. The problem is not with God, it's always been with us. We'll close with that thought of 